In the spring of 2012, I was working my first job as a political reporter with an online news site. I really love the idea of becoming an expert in something by noon every day, depending on the news of the day and how it drove us. And it was this endless search for stories, however, that led me into the Queen's Park Media Studio, when environmental groups were often coming in to talk about the latest water or biodiversity crisis. And it was an easy story, right? And so I would dutifully go down, and I would sit, and I would listen, and I'd ask my questions. Often I was the only reporter in the room, and I'd go back upstairs to my office and file my copy by five o'clock. But there was something about these stories I found that really stuck with me. I mean, you know, politicians come and go, but the earth is forever, right? And while my editor wasn't particularly pleased with my burgeoning environmental coverage, I kept it up. So I started writing longer features for magazines, and my very first feature, came in this magazine in 2012, later on that year, and it was a story about an invasive fish that had thrown North America into even greater depths of ecological chaos. And when you pulled up the magazine, the centerfold showed an unassuming river somewhere in Illinois with what appeared to be more silvery fish leaping above the water than could possibly be swimming in it. They were silver carp. And they're part of a family of four fish it was like that you've likely heard of, even in passing, Asian carp. And in addition to silver carp, there's black grass and big head, four species that are cultivated in parts of China and Russia where they have been grown there for approximately 8,000 years. They can also grow to the size of Great Danes, which is easy to do when you eat 20% of your body weight each and every day. And this is what they look like. Now, I know what you're thinking. These are bloody terrifying, right? But like, they don't swim anywhere near here, do they? And the short answer is no, but the long answer should give us all reason to be concerned. Because these monstrous invasive fish and their bottomless appetites are inching closer towards the Great Lakes, where we expect they will outcompete and outbreed every native fish species in the basin. And so as I started looking for other environmental stories to tell, I came across a news piece about an $18 billion proposal to hydrologically separate the Great Lakes from the Mississippi Basin. And in the process, it would effectively halt anything that was moving between them, water, but also any species in the Great Lakes that we didn't want in the Mississippi, and species in the Mississippi that we didn't want in the Great Lakes. And I've always been really captivated by these massive projects that we create as humans to bend nature. And normally, though, the rationale for something like this is some central human need, usually, water or food or shelter. But in this case, the rationale was different. It was about stopping a fish, which I thought was strange. And it was my curiosity that led me from there, but if I'm honest, also some minor sense of obligation. I was amazed as I looked into this issue how fuzzy the details were about how Asian carp were first came to North America. Because the common narrative that we constantly heard was that it was ignorant fish farmers who brought these fish in, who didn't care a lick about what impact they might have on the environment. But in reality, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that this was actually a story about us, about our greed and our lack of foresight. And as soon as I looked into it, I realized that the story that we were telling ourselves was essentially a fairy tale. Because in reality, when people turned on the evening news, they would see this. Images and videos of leaping silver carp, the, like, just like there was in that magazine feature that I wrote about, that really effectively downplayed just how serious this whole thing is, because often the videos show boaters getting hit and it's supposed to be really light and funny, as if it's this amazing, comical thing, but it's not, because people have been and continue to be seriously hurt by these leaping fish. Silver carp, when they jump as a fight-or-flight mechanism, they have broken noses and collarbones. They have left boaters concussed and near dead. But despite the heavy media coverage about Asian carp, I was amazed in a way that no one had written a book about them. And so I thought, why not me? And so I left my job at Queen's Park, and I threw myself into the world of Asian carp in order to debunk this myth. And over the course of four years, I traveled to a dozen states and provinces, 
I met with approximately eight dozen biologists, politicians, chefs, and a czar. We spoke in marshes and laboratories and uh, canoes and in a processing plant where I tried not to vomit from the stink of liquefying fish. It was exhilarating. It was <laughs> exhausting. And the book that I wrote became Overrun, Dispatches from the Asian Carp Crisis, which was published in March of 2019. So four years of research turned up reason to worry. Asian carp, as I mentioned, are an invasive species, meaning that here, in North America at least, they have no evolutionary relationship with the species that we think are supposed to be here. But this distinction matters a great deal. It's the difference between these species being part of an ecosystem versus dominating that ecosystem, putting untold and undue pressure on native fish species who have no mechanisms for competing or dealing with this massive new presence in their home. And to make matters worse, unlike an invasive that maybe you've heard of, like zebra mussels, which came here in the bellies of ocean tankers in the 1980s, we brought Asian carp to North America, not only on purpose, but with the express blessing of scientists and governments alike. Why? Well, in the early 1960s, Rachel Carson's groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, hammered home the idea that the indiscriminate spraying of chemical pesticides like DDT in order to be able to stop nuisance bugs was killing birds and mammals and fish and ultimately us. She believed that there had to be a better way. And hearing her message were a group of resource officials who were also themselves tired of constantly having to spend huge amounts of money to be able to spray to control those nuisance bugs. And so they went looking for a biologically sound alternative to chemicals. And they believed in grass carp, that they had found just such a species. And so in 1963, the United States joined dozens of other countries around the world in importing Asian carp from China. And grass carp, let's be clear, were miracle fish. They were exactly as advertised. Their appetite for aquatic weeds was insatiable. And so, based on this success, we started spawning them in increased numbers. States and, and industry began buying them to clean everything from irrigation canals to golf course ponds. They were this miracle fish. And looking to build on this success, those same resource officials then learned about two other species related to grass carp that were being cultured alongside them in China, in big head and silver carp. And so they imported those fish with the intention of using them to be able to clean ponds uh, where catfish were being bred, which at the time was a new but multi-million dollar industry. So, in they came. Silver and big head carp came in on Flying Tiger Airlines and landed at the Little Rock, Arkansas airport in August of 1972. And it turns out they were amazing at cleaning those catfish ponds, but in another way they were terrible at cleaning those catfish ponds. As we saw in the photo earlier, they grew so big that when it came time to harvest the catfish, they would beat and thrash and kill the vast majority of the catfish that they were being cultivated alongside. And so, it became pretty clear, pretty quickly, that Silver and Bighead were not going to have the future we thought they would in North America. But at this point, states and industry and universities had invested very heavily in the success of this fish. So, what did they do? Well, in Silicon Valley speak, they pivoted. It's hard to overstate just how central and common an idea it was in America in the 1970s to simply siphon off solids and dump raw human sewage in whatever poor stream happened to be nearby. Folk singer Pete Seeger immortalized this in his song, My Dirty Stream, that he wrote about his beloved Hudson River. Down the valley, one million toilet chains, he sang, find my Hudson, so convenient place to drain. And each little city says, who? Me? Do you think that sewage plants come free? And in 1972, that same year, the Clean Water Act was introduced by the US government and it changed everything. And it brought about an extreme shift in how small governments were able to process their waste. And Asian carp weren't free, but they were at the center of this and they were certainly cheaper than building sewage plants. And so, 
with the blessing of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the Environmental Protection Agency that had been created just a few years before, states began testing in sewage lagoons whether Asian carp would be able to not only treat our waste, but survive long term, eating nothing but raw human feces. Turns out they could. <laughs> they were really, really good at it. We even threw on another test to see whether those same fish reared in those sewage lagoons would be suitable for us to eat. Turns out they were. However, the reason why we're not eating silver carp now is because the man responsible for that study packaged his results and he mailed them to Washington and he waited. But he had very bad timing because right around the early 1980s at this stage, Ronald Reagan was elected and effectively declared war on the environment. And all of the money that was used for those pilot projects dried up. And while the fish that were used in the Arkansas pilot project were all destroyed properly, many fish farmers who suddenly were left with these stocks of fish that they had invested so heavily in didn't really know what to do with them. And so they simply let them go. And soon after, their numbers ballooned in the wild. So, Long after the plan that brought Asian carp here has since been done away with, why then are these fish still here? Well, largely it's because of our bottomless pride, again, in thinking that we could bend nature to our will. We didn't spend a lot of time thinking about whether these fish would be able to survive in the laboratories and ponds that we kept them in because we didn't care. And early on after Asian carp made it into the wild, this lack of concern hijacked any discussion that we could have been having when it counted about how to be able to contain them, which was only going to get harder, and how, what impact they might have on the environments that they made it into. But we did not do this. And so on our own, and with our help, Asian carp, grass carp in particular, as you can see on the map, spread out from their starting point in Arkansas, and they headed south to the Gulf of Mexico, where they have proven capable of surviving in increasingly salty water, which we didn't think that they were capable of. They have moved west to Oregon and California. They have moved east to the Atlantic seaboard, and they have moved north to the Great Lakes. And the amazing thing was, when we bothered to take some time to think early on about what impact they would have, we managed to convince ourselves that they would never be able to survive here. But it was not long before Asian carp, in some rivers they, made, they lived in, like the Mississippi, formed 97% of all life in the river. That is the entire cumulative biomass of the river. Yet, we are fortunate in a way that their distance from the Great Lakes, which is about 75 kilometers at this point, does buy us time to be able to come to terms with something crucial, namely that we have failed utterly to connect the spread of Asian carp to the climate crisis that is boiling us like frogs in a pot. It's not hard to see why we have struggled to solve the Asian carp problem. Coming to terms with this crisis is especially challenging in and of itself, but if we truly want to reckon with this issue, we also have to begin to appreciate the impact that extreme rainfall events have on their spread. But in addition to that, how we grow our food and how we build our cities. Now, what do these conceptual issues have to do with an invasive fish, you might be asking, and it's a fair question. So let's dive right in. North American cities are smothered in concrete. It's the result of decades of urban planning that has effectively paved over anything and everything that is capable of absorbing rain. And so in order to be able to keep streets from flooding, many cities who are unaccustomed to the kinds of extreme rainfall events that we're seeing now, in order to keep their basements and streets from flooding, they use something called combined sewer overflows that take our excess rainwater and they mix it directly with raw sewage and pollutants and used condoms, and they dump all of this material into whatever local waterway happens to be nearby. Don't be too smug about it, fellow Torontonians. Toronto has combined sewer overflows too. But let's keep talking about rain for a moment because it's also falling on our farmland. And there are simply too many farmer's fields was like that are covered with fertilizer sitting on top of the soil that during heavy rainfalls flows into streams or into ditches and streams and rivers that ultimately also makes it into those rivers. But here's the kicker. 
all of that fertilizer from farmers' fields and all of that pollutant and high water that is coming from these fast-moving events from extreme rainfall is leading to rivers that are whipping fast and they are full of nutrients that are causing algal blooms. Well, Asian carp species require two things to be able to survive. Fast water, which they use as a spawning cue, and it also help keep, keeps their eggs buoyant to lead to population booms in later years. And they require a steady source of food. And those algae blooms that are coming as a result of that fertilizer are feeding them like an endless buffet. If we do not get a handle on extreme rainfall events, and if we don't find a way to keep more fertilizer locked in the soil where it's useful, and to actually protect our rivers and our streams from farm runoff and, and from urban pollution caused by CSOs, then we will never get a, control, a handle on the Asian carp crisis, and we will never control the algae that is endlessly feeding them. So, ensuring that governments are actually building sewers capable of handling our waste and building green infrastructure for cities are essential components in the fight against Asian carp. But those solutions don't all have to be on the same scale as solving the global climate crisis. There are small-scale solutions as well. We can continue to pay to protect the Great Lakes from invasives and other pollutions. We can build wetlands, which we have done a terrific job at destroying over the past century. We can renaturalize the waterways that we haven't paved over yet. And we, in areas where Asian carp thrive, we can pay fishers to catch as many of them as possible, which has single-handedly been the most successful thing that some states have done to be able to get a handle on the problem. I asked earlier what a future for the Great Lakes might look like, and it would be emptier in a number of ways. But perhaps the real question that we should be asking is whether this is the future that we want for the Great Lakes. And it starts with recognizing, as Al Gore encouraged us to do, an inconvenient truth, namely that we are responsible for the acts of environmental violence that Asian carp and other invasive species have so successfully taken advantage of. It's us. It always is. And for, if in order for us to wake up and truly get a handle on the crisis that we now face, we need to recognize that our impacts on moving species around the planet is only going to get worse as the climate crisis widens and as globalization deepens. But remember, it does not have to be this way. Asian carp are not an illness. They are but a symptom of the modern condition of humans in the world that we live in. But most importantly, we have the cure for them, and we can take it at any time. Thank you very much.